Well, first, I'd like to thank everyone for my availability at today's 11th annual student-led conference, sponsored by the Dalla Lana School of Public Health as we confront the drug poisoning crisis. Of particular note, uh, the 40 years of my incarceration, I spent 11 years in an underground supermax in the States, which was nothing short of torturing the soul. On a more positive theme, uh, when I arrived in Canada in 1993 via extradition, I became involved with PASAN, and through their organization, I was exposed to other organizations in Canada, and which allowed a part of me to become fruitful, which is my need to help uh, my fellow prisoners and give something back to society, because I took so much as a young man. And just being that example of being involved in today is, is very important to me. It gives me a voice where I can re represent a class of people that is not traditionally represented in a positive and or intellectual or intelligent manner. And it offers me the opportunity to be a spokesperson for, for these group of people that is much needed to, to have our voice heard, that there, because we, there's always a public discord by corrections by the government, but there's also a flip side to that story that is very seldom heard. There's been quite a few uh, changes, um, such as the Narcan nasal spray, which came in within the last two years. Uh, we have bleach dispensers now. Uh, probably the last five to six years went nationwide, but um, in particular institution I'm in, it's right under a camera, so there's not much uh, security for the individuals that need to use it, and they're frankly hesitant to use it, and they'd rather use a dirty needle than uh, expose themselves to being on camera. The needle exchange program through agencies such as FISAN and their sister agencies is, 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 is having fruition soon. There was a tattooing program of uh, years back, uh, uh, but the Harper government crushed that immediately. That was designed to fail, which promoted uh, the safe art of tattooing within prison, which clearly it was beneficial to reducing harm, you know, harm reduction. Uh, the Unfortunate uh, at budget cuts, and every time there is an announced budget cut, it's not the warden's salary, it's not the amount of guns they're going to buy, it's not the shiny uniforms that get cut. It's all inmate programming. It all falls on our heads. Every single cut falls on our heads. And it shows up in areas such as mental health, where they're no longer required to have some of the professionals that used to be here, and it's passed on to lower grade educations. And it's just, it's extremely difficult to deal with real issues. And if you're not having your, your, your mental health dealt with, it clearly leads into um, some drug use, frankly. When the, when the budget cuts, cuts come into effect, it, it basically just affects prisoners purely. <clears throat> Whether it's the food we're fed, the programs we have access to, recreational equipment, uh, outside opportunities to come in and make presentations to us, everything. It's, it, they're not cutting the warden's salary. They're not getting rid of the guns. Uh, they're not backing off on brand new shiny razor wire. Every single budget cut you can imagine falls on the heads of prisoners. <clears throat> and the access to the tools and equipment we need, whether it be programming, whether it be facilities, whether it be harm reduction equipment, it, it, it hits us pure and simple. And it, it's not like they're hiring less guards. They're just uh, providing less services to the prison population. And that, that involves mental health. It involves uh, your, our regular health with health services and the nurses and access to doctors. It, it covers the full spectrum of everything. And it's, it's becoming quite taxing extremely difficult just to maintain some semblance of health in an environment that is notorious for people being unhealthy. I am 60, currently 61. I came in at 21, a rather energetic young lad, and uh, people tell me I'm in much better shape than the average man my age because I, I'm determined to stay as healthy as I can. But they make it more difficult for those who have the willpower and desire to do so. Traditionally, uh, pr prison is now, uh, unfortunately, due to what Harper's uh, law changes made, we're serving much longer sentences. 
And yes, the prison population is aging, and yes, that has dire effects on our physical and mental health needs, but particularly physical, the dental, doctor's appointments. It, I mean, it's extremely hard to, when you have, <clears throat> what I tell people is if I have a serious injury, a serious illness, I would prefer to be 10 miles in the deep woods with a major injury, because I know I can at least crawl my way. It might take me a day or two, but crawl my way back to society and lay in the open road until someone comes by to take me to the local hospital. Whereas in here, you have a major injury or serious illness. I know fellows who need cancer treatments, uh, radio, you know, the chemotherapy, and they just postpone, postpone, postpone. And we, oh, it's the same as society. Say, no, it's not. No, it's not. It, it's, we get the bottom line, the bottom of the barrel, and it, it accumulates, and it's been accumulating. And uh, frankly, men are living shorter lives. A lot of them have come, men and women for that matter, a lot of, a lot of uh, inmates have come in, had uh, drug addiction problems prior, had alcoholism, had nutritional problems, and it becomes exasperated in prison, although they may not have access to the alcohol or, or the drugs that are prevalent in society. They're going to find something in here, but the wear and tear in their bodies and their minds is just not being addressed adequately, uh, to say the least. Well, I'm very proud to say that I was the long-term chairman of the Exceptional People's Olympiad, which is an Olympic-style event held uh, at Collins Bay Institution for the third weekend of July every year, which brings in up to 150 physically and mentally challenged athletes from facilities around uh, Ontario and Quebec. And it's such an awe-inspiring situation just to have the inmates who become the athletes' god brothers and are assigned to them for the weekend to watch the men come together and physically drop their mask of being the big bad prisoner and give of themselves to someone who is less fortunate than they are. And in most cases, due to no fault of their own, whether it be you know, a birth situation, whether it be an accident situation, but to watch these men come together, it's truly an amazing, heart-wrenching situation. That, it, it, it just, it frankly makes me cry and gets me most of just talking about it. But to have been involved with this event was so awe-inspiring for me and changed my life in so many positive ways. But the whole, it's, it's the, the fact that this was prisoner-led 20 years before I came around, and to give shout-outs to all the men who, who poured their hearts out for this prior to me, and it's unfortunately, it's now defunct. Um, since I left Collins Bay and moved out my, my correctional journey, somewhere along the way, it, it, it fell by the wayside, unfortunately. And it was it was devastating to hear that news. But to have inmates get involved in these kind of public service activities that shows our humanity, that shows we can be civil, as I said, dropping our mask and getting rid of this whole prison stereotypical convict thing and, and and allows us to interact and relate as human beings. It's extremely important because it gives us hope. It, it, it reminds us of who we could be, should be, were at once time, strive to be. And to watch 200 prisoners on the yard running an Olympic style event and they're all together doing one common goal, one common theme, that's helping others. And they know they can't be out there if they're actively involved with the drug situation. They can't be out there with their attitudes. They can't be out there with their criminogenic thinking. They're there for a purpose. They're there for a goal. And this just isn't a weekend because we plan all year for this event. And it develops into a lifestyle. And it helps so many men. It was highly touted by the administration, highly touted by uh, the higher ups and corrections. And we actually did a television special on that to help educate society on some of the good things that are going on inside the penitentiary. And it's comforting to know that someone's driving by Collins Bay, having seen the special the night before, and they say, hey, there's something good going on behind those big, massive walls. And uh, it's just awe-inspiring when men can get, men and women for that matter, can get together and give of themselves to others. And it's something that... Corrections needs much more of instead of the enforcement, instead of the policies, instead of the regulations.
regulations to make us regimented good little prisoners. Uh, that's not going to make a productive citizen. Never did, never will. It gives him an alternative to the typical criminogenic school of crime within prison. It, it's They're publicly stating, I'm stepping aside from you guys, and I'm going to do this because it's the right thing to do. And in many cases, it's life-altering. It gives them a platform. When you become in, in prison, when you become involved in something so public like that, and you've made a declaration, I'm dedicating myself to this event, it, it becomes a foundation stone that you can grow from and engage, and it exposes a whole different world to us of the outside agencies, the volunteers, how do you how do you do the math of all this? How do you raise the money? How do you organize the events? It, it builds it builds skill sets in us as well. It just doesn't happen by happenstance. Men have to be hard working and dedicated to make these events fruitful and successful. What's needed the most is outside participation and lack of better term interference from society and the agencies demand that the government and corrections, that you have a bigger, fruitful voice in what's actually going on here. After all, this is your tax dollars at work. It's a hidden society. Most people don't know very much about what's going on behind the walls and fences of Canadian penitentiaries. You need to know. If you're, if you're interested in what's going on in here, you have to have a bigger voice. You have to talk to your, your parliamentarian, your legislators, demand a bigger voice. What's going on in here? What are we paying for? How come these men and women are coming out with diseases, with drug addictions, malfunctions? Why is recidivism rate what it is today? So you, everyone here in attendance today at this conference, demand a bigger voice. Tell everyone it's not at this conference. Demand a bigger voice. You want to see the nuts and bolts of what you're paying for. What's going on? Come in as volunteers, interact with our various group leaders within the institution, whether it's the inmate committee, whether it's the chairman of the lifers group, which I happen to be right now, whether it's the peer health program, which I was on, on the founding stages of 20 years ago. There's agencies in, within the prison working hard, reaching out to you guys, and we need you to reach back. When we extend our hand, we need someone to grasp it. And that just made me most. When we extend our hand, we need to know the comfort that someone's going to make contact with us. And which is so helpful when we have agencies like the SAD. There's a voice on the other end of the line that I can talk to when I'm in my uh, depressive modes, let's say. And when we extend that hand, when we get creative, we need to we need we need to be nourished. We need to be fed. We need to have that creativity just blossom instead of beaten down by a system with its rules, its regulations, and its policies. Thank you much, and it's been my privilege and honor to have being afforded the opportunity to participate in this very important matter.